Yeah. Today. <laughs> In the last minute. Oh, the hat. So, so you'll see here the, the, the powerful, powerful hat that I have here. Protects your skull from flying objects. Uh, it's also white. It's a hat. It's a construction hat because we're going to talk about building something new and exciting. And we're going to pass the hat around and we're going to ask you to put some money in it. Just like church. I know you're all good churchgoers. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Testify. Uh, you put your card in here. I'll, t I'll take care of that for you. <laughs> so, yes, the hat will be around. Uh, Seth will be in charge of the hat. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, yes, thank you, Seth, for volunteering. Uh, and that's about it. Nick, you want to get this party started here? Okay. Are we, is AV ready to go? Are we rolling? Okay, We're at great. speed. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Hackerspace Initiative Talk. Uh, I'm Nick Farr. I'm the treasurer of the Hacker Foundation. That's Jesse Krems. He's the president of the Hacker Foundation. You can tell I'm the president by the way I dress. You can tell he's the treasurer by the way he dresses. Um, just, to, just to set you guys up, these are some of the things that we hope to answer today. Um, one, we're one, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I went to Germany for the 23rd Chaos Communications Congress is that in Europe, their hackerspaces are really great. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that here. And I know many of you may not be acquainted with hackerspace networks uh, in Europe, so we're going to explain a little bit of that and sort of set up the next question, which is more about U.S. hackerspaces. We've had hackerspaces in this country just as long as they have had in Europe, but our hackerspaces tend to have no more than a five-year lifespan. Suck! And I'm good. CBS. <laughs> yeah, it's CBS. And so what, what I hope to do is explain um, from a sociological perspective why we believe that is. And then going into the, sort of the meat of the talk, why we think the hacker community in the United States should start building hackerspaces. And of course, pointing out why are hackerspaces necessary. Awesome. Um, but um, just to give you a general outline of where we're going with this, part one, we're going to try to define what hackerspaces are and why they're necessary. Part two, we're going to sort of pick through the sociological um, reasons why hackerspaces in the US tend to die. And then part three, again, the meat of the talk, uh, how we're trying through the hackerspaces initiative local groups, people in your community, your hacker groups, the people that you get together with at 2600 DEF CON groups meetings, get together, get organized, and start building a hackerspace in your community. You might have read that from the, 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 uh, the program that got you in the first place. Um, but so first, Jesse's going right. to... I'm going to talk about the foundation, because some of you may not know what the foundation does. Who here knows what the foundation is and does and all about it? Yeah, you're on the board, Christian. You don't count. You're asking to be on the board. You plan. Anybody else? You guys have no clue. You know what it is. So who here knows what it is? OK, good. I have a good reason to talk. About. So we're a 501c3. Uh, Nick and I got together in a 2003 and did some paperwork and talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And then we uh, filed paperwork with the IRS, and they got back to us in 2004. Yes, yes, bureaucracy, one year of waiting for paperwork. And so we are officially a 501c3 that does money, essentially. Uh, Hackers are bad at paperwork, and I'm really bad at paperwork, and that's why I wanted uh, to do this, is that I want someone else to do the paperwork, because it's more important for you to be doing hacker stuff and not doing um, paperwork, and we wanted to give you access to funding. So that's the why of us. And so we've got these two new things on the board this year. One's the funds initiative, which I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, the funds is, it's like paying taxes for things you actually want. I hope that sounds OK. Uh, but the idea is that we've created a bunch of funds, con scholarship, college scholarship, Kiva fund, uh, where you can contribute money, and then there's a means to get that money out, or it's used in the name of hackers in the US uh, to get us good press or public support. Uh, and you can also roll your own fund. We did that for Metasploit. They have a fund that's serving them pretty well. They're, they're raking in the cash. Uh, what's the number, Nick, this um, month? I'm not sure, but they've had a lot of donation activity in the past uh, 72 hours. Yeah, oh, so we also talk about Johnny Long, who's going to Oh, yeah. So Johnny Long, who knows who he is? He's a great guy, right? Fun, tons of fun. Nice, nice man. He's going to Africa, uh, and he's r we're helping him raise funds. We're doing the matching program with the company that he works with so that uh, he can go to Africa and do some tech stuff in the field in Uganda uh, and some medical work and some construction work in Uganda, your standard, you know, I'm a good person. I'm going to Africa to go help. Uh, and that's, that's 
stuff we do. We do things, we, we channel money for you in the proper ways. All right, hackers on a plane is way cooler than money. Hackers on a plane. Can I say it? Can I say it? I want these motherfucking hackers on this motherfucking plane. <laughs> yeah! Okay, so here we go. DEF CON's awesome. CCC Camp is awesome. CCC Camp is like three days after DEF CON this year. So what are we going to do? We're going to get on a plane, and we're going to fly from one to the other. Go cheaper this time, so you can actually go. Got your admission for DEF CON, got your admission for CCC Camp, get you in at the American quote-unquote embassy at CCC Camp, Camp Anaconda. <laughs> yeah, Camp Anaconda. Everyone loves that. Um, and we also got return flights, so you're not stuck there. Uh, and we're trying to take care of a lot of the annoying paperwork with, you know, customs. You'll need a passport and all that, but it'll be totally awesome. Uh, and it's going to be pretty exciting. And that's a little thing. Yeah. We're going to go from here to here. Now, now Jesse, where, where are we going to be landing? You know, oh. we're taking off in Las Vegas, but where are people going to land? Okay, so you're going to fly to Germany. You're going to land at the big airport, Frankfurt. You're going to go through customs, so, you know, we don't all have to get back on the plane and fly back. Uh, individually, by the way, and that is a group. And then uh, we're going to take a chartered airplane directly to the convention, land at the airstrip where the convention is. We're going to get off the back of the plane. It'll be like one of those scenes from a movie. I don't know which movie, but a cool movie. <laughs> we're going to walk slowly. The plane is not going to explode like a Jerry Brockheimer film, though. And we're going to we go hope. to our privately set up camp for us by the Germans. Yes. Connor! No, we thought about that name, too. But okay. cool. Thank you, Jesse. No problem. <laughs> now I get to do the hard part. No, no, the volunteers. Oh, volunteers. So, as you can figure out by the time, the way I talk and how I deport myself, we need help and lots of it. So, we need help for project liaison officers, those are people that work with projects, volunteer coordinators, people that coordinate volunteers, very exciting stuff, grant coordination, fundraising, and marketing and PR help. So, if you want to help us and you think we're doing good stuff, let us know because, well, we do need the help. And the thing is, we know there are a lot of people in the community who do these sorts of things in their day job and, you know, might not be mad coders like they once were, but are saying, you know, I do these sorts of things in my day job and I'd like to be able to use the skills that I'm developing in my career to be able to help the community. And the Hacker Foundation acts as a conduit for you to be able to do that. So if you do any of these things professionally, if you have done any of these things professionally, um, you or know people get, that do this professionally? Right. <laughs> we're, you know, donate your expertise to the rest of the community through the Hacker Foundation. Get in touch with us. Our website, hackerfoundation.org, that has all the information that you need to contact us so that you can get to work to help the community. So uh, now it's important. Now comes the next thing. <laughs> we could cover this topic, put money in the hat, shake them down. Uh. And also, for those of you who have been to the con suite, you know that we have those donation buckets set up for our various different funds. If there's something like that that you're interested in. That guy is going for his wallet. Get his money right there. <laughs> Yeah, come, to become a better fundraiser. come visit us in the con suite, have a good time hanging out, enjoy all the free food, enjoy the company, enjoy the better network connection. Um, and, you know, if there's something that you like that you're interested in, put your money towards it. And Al was wondering about Amex. Yes, we do accept Amex and corporate Amex through our website. Uh, in denominations as high as one bajillion dollars if you want to <laughs> give it to us. Uh, it's a wonderful way to give money. Um, and you can give money, you know, if you don't have cash on you right now, you can go to the foundation website and donate there, and that would be very handy as well. Yeah, where is the con suite, Nick? The con suite is on the second floor. Take the elevators up to the second floor. When you get out of the elevators, go right. It's all the way at the end of the hall. It's the only open door on the left-hand side. He, you look... S he, dude, you... Did you do this before, <laughs> Seth? <laughs> you do... You're really doing it, really. Yeah. yeah. We got to give you one of those sticks so you can get way back in the back rows there. <laughs> All right, I like this. Okay. So let's uh, so do your thing. You want me to run the click? Yeah, could you? This okay. is what I'm really good at. I'm okay. gonna stop talking. Thank you, Jesse. Um, just to introduce. We started the Hackerspaces Initiative. This is an internal project to HF. Most HF projects right now are ways that we help different groups who are running things outside of the foundation. This is something that people within the foundation um, are working on. Uh, the mission statement of the Hacker Foundation sort of defines, you know, what we're trying to do. And a lot of the things that we set out to do in our mission statement, we're realizing, require some kind of physical presence. They require an infrastructure in real space 
to be able to accomplish. And that's why, we, that's why the Hackerspaces Initiative is a really important thing so that we can continue to do the work that we set out to do. Um, this is sort of the very, this is the synopsis of what our mission statement is all about. We have five key values. The first thing is anything that the Hacker Foundation does has to be sustainable. It has to be something that can continue on indefinitely. You know, we, there's so many things in the hacker community, a lot of different projects that fork, that die, the primary maintainer loses his leadership role or just decides to do something else and the project dies. It's critical for the hacker community to start working on things that have sustainability built in right into it. And that's why that's a very important part of our mission statement. Next point, equitable. A lot of things in the hacker community are closed off. They're people, they're a core group of friends that, you know, don't like to bring in outsiders. A lot of hackers in, in this country, you know, you don't see this so much in Europe, but in this country you see people building walls around themselves and what they're doing to send out to the rest of the world. One of the things that the Hacker Foundation... Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that was a good rake. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> Hacker Foundation projects need to be open, inclusive, equitable, bringing everybody else in. This leads into collaborative development. True collaborative development means that anybody with the right talent, the right skills, at the right time can help work on the project. We open and actively encourage anybody that's working with the Hacker Foundation to do things collaborative and to set up their internal systems in a way that allows people with the right talents to be able to contribute to the project effectively. Innovative is not so hard. Hackers are pushing the edge of the envelope all the time. But it's, in, it's important to mention that hacker foundation projects need to be pushing the envelope. They need to be on the bleeding edge. It's not something, you know, we really don't want to start doing things that other groups and other outfits are doing. This is purposely why hacker foundation doesn't take part in projects that are technical, overtly political, things like that. Because that's what the EFF is for. You know, they're out there doing the political thing. Now, if there's something that you want to accomplish politically that requires a technical project behind it before you can continue, the Hacker Foundation is here to help you with that technical project. But if you're doing things politically, if you want to get involved with what the EFF is doing, do that. That's a very important thing, but that's not what the Hacker Foundation is about. This is something that the Germans had a hard time understanding. And of course, for it to be a nonprofit, for it to be a 501c3, for, it, for donations to the Hacker Foundation to be tax deductible in the United States, there has to be an altruistic element to it. All HSI funding models have to qualify in and of themselves under the rubric that the IRS sets out in the tax code because every donations to the Hacker Foundation are tax deductible and we have to make sure that everybody that's working with the Hacker Foundation maintains that so that we don't lose our status. The, the real core value what these five key values feed into is helping facilitate local access to information and technological resources. And, you know, so getting back more back to hackerspaces, um, we've sort of identified four types of different hackerspaces. Just to let you know what we're referring to as hackerspaces. The first kind, which the American hacker scene is very, very good at, local gatherings. DEF CON groups, 2600, BINREV, local groups that meet periodically in temporal space. The United States does really, really well and has been doing really well for a really long time. So when you get together, you know, with a group of buddies at your local 2600 meeting, that is a temporary hacker space right there. It's a gateway into the deeper, darker hacker lifestyle. Okay. And then... <laughs> you know. It's enlightening, though. All right. Moving on from there, something that's, you know, the next step up from the local gathering is a hacker space where you're at. Hacker conventions are another temporal hacker space that occupies space for a set amount of time, get together, and enjoy community and get things done. You might notice you're at one. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, these, these temporal spaces, which means that these spaces are limited in time from the outset, um, is that, you know, occasionally, not a con is an exception to this, but when you go to a lot of other hacker cons and you've never been to a hacker con, you're there by yourself, you want to engage with the community, hackers in this country really aren't good at inviting people. You know, the normal process of community in the hacker scene in the United States is you know, to build up a thing and acquire members. But there's that membership gap. There's that general barrier to entry that makes it really hard for somebody who's never been to a HackerCon before, who doesn't know how hackers interact face-to-face, -to, -face, to be able to meaningly, meaningfully interact with the community right from the outset. You know, there's a learning curve there that 
is a disadvantage to a temporal space that we think, and when, that when we're designing hackerspaces, we're going to try to help local groups overcome. We want hackerspaces to be open and inviting to everybody in the community. I mean, that's, that's critical if hackerspaces are going to forward the goals of you know, bringing this community, making it more productive, and giving hackers a good name. You know, when I say I work for the Hacker Foundation and I'm talking to another corporate suit on a flight, they say, like, well, well who was, you know, Mr. Hacker? I'm like, no, hacker, like in the sense of computer hacker. And they say, wait, hackers have a foundation? You, you can get money for that? And, I mean, this is one of the reasons I wear a suit. If I was wearing a T-shirt and jeans, the guy would, you know, put his headphones on and not talk to me for the rest of the flight. That's my problem. Right. But at least... <laughs> really, it is. Yeah. But at least wearing a suit, I can talk to him and I can sort of say, you know, no, ha hackers are not bad people. The problem is, is that in the United States, the word hacker in common parlance is a synonym for computer criminal. Take the power back. I, I, I mean, I, I personally believe that hackers are not automatically bad people. But the problem is, is that in the U.S. That <laughs> Wait a second. Let's roll that one back. So, Nick. Tell me what you think about the word hacker and how it doesn't automatically mean criminal. Go sit down. <laughs> but no, seriously, I think that people who, people who have everything to fear for what hackers do and how they apply their creative ingenuity, the, the people who have nothing to gain from that have co-opted the term hacker in the public parlance to be a synonym for computer criminal. We're trying to take the term back and to tell people in the U.S. what hacker really means. And one of the best ways to do this is to do good works. To do, that's why the Hacker Foundation exists, is to bring the hacker community in the United States forward and achieve the same kind of recognitions that hackers have in Europe. You know, when, when somebody says hacker in Europe, they don't think, oh, well, hackers are computer criminals. They understand that there is that unavoidable to it. But they also understand that hackers are creative people. Pa hackers are people that think in ways that the average person does not think, and they use that thinking to do good things. They use that thinking for free speech. They use that thinking to point out where there are flaws in products that everybody uses. That hackers are good. Um, but I, I, that was a little bit of an aside. While these cons are really great and while face-to-face -face interaction is good, you can't do everything online, collaborate in all the ways that, you know, there is an advantage to face-to-face -to -face communication. Hacker cons are limited. You know, there for three days, everybody shows up, everybody does really great stuff, and then everybody leaves. And I think people have a hard time taking the networks and taking the connections and taking the things that they learn at hacker cons and applying it when they go back home, which is why we think hacker spaces are necessary. A third type of hacker group space, and sort of a variant, sort of a subset um, of the hacker that we're doing, is a hacker group living situation. If you look at the history of hackers in this country, there have been a lot of different hacker group living situations. You don't see it so commonly right now, but it's basically what it is. A bunch of hackers rent an apartment, they rent a loft, they get together, and while that is their primary living space, their primary residence, because they're all hackers and they all live together, they end up working on projects, they end up sharing, they end up collaborating in that living space. But you really wouldn't want to open up some place that you live, you know, your house, to any hacker out there in the community, which is why the hackerspace that we're talking about is necessary. When we say hackerspace in the hackerspace initiatives, we're talking about a fixed, non-residential research space. In Europe, the Chaos Computer Club is probably the best example of this. Um, the Chaos Computer Club is a network of regional groups, and most of these regional groups occupy a space in their local community, and they use that space to collaborate on projects. Um, another kind of hackerspace in Berlin, Seabase, is a hacker artist collective that also happens to be a club. I mean, th if there was a way that we could possibly get someplace like Seabase in the United States, that would be just absolutely incredible. And that's a really great way that they interact with their outside community. Seabase on the top level is a club. It's a nightclub like any other nightclub that you've been to. They have a bar, they offer food, um, and they open, you know, they open to the public to invite people in. But below Seabase, you have an, a really large basement. You have a recording studio down there. They have a computer lab. They have many, many different things. I strongly encourage you to check out, is it Seabase.d? Um, I think so. Oh, it's Seabase.org, C slash base.org. Another hackerspace which we're looking at um, in modeling hackerspaces in HSI is MetaLab in Vienna, Austria. 
it's another open collaborative workspace um, that's an intersection between artists and hackers out there. This is the kind of thing that we're trying to do with HSI, to try to bring back what they're doing in Europe and make it happen here. But in our own, sp what are you? But in our own special American way. Right. Um, we're not Germans. You know, as you can see from this map, most of the hacker spaces that have achieved some you know, semblance of notoriety in the national consciousness are along the quote-unquote three coasts, the East Coast, the West Coast, and Chicagoland area, which is commonly referred to as the Third Coast. And as you see, space, the spaces have come, they've gone, they've gone. Hasty Pastry, which is um, in Boston, Loft started in Boston, members of the Loft moved to New Hack City in San Francisco on the West Coast. Um, and, this oh, I forgot to mention, the prototype hackerspace, the hackerspace that we're using to test out a lot of the theories that we've been developing over the past couple of months is going to be in Washington, D.C. And this ties back to something that the CCC does in Berlin. The CCC headquarters in Berlin is located very close to the Reichstag, which is the, the seat of the government for Germany. And because of that proximity, they're able to, t to do a lot of things on a political level, um, collect sorts of things, advocate for hackers in a certain way, not necessarily forward overtly um, political things like candidates for office and different things like that, but that proximity to government helps influence things and influence different procedures, ways that government does work to make life better and to allow hackers to contribute back to the community and to the country as a whole. One of the members was an ICANN director. Yeah, no, one of the CCC members is an ICANN director. Okay. Yeah. By the way, this, uh, that little map there, uh, we know it's not comprehensive, and if you have locations on there, tell me about them, because besides being a really handy map, it also sells as a bit of historical record. Yeah, actually, this would be a good time to uh, sort of take a break real quickly and uh, just show you most of the stuff that we're talking about right here is in the Hacker Foundation wiki. You saw, um, you all, I can see it in your computers anyway, so I know you're watching. Yeah, every, everything that we're talking about in this speech and a lot of the theories that we're developing, sort of things that we're learning from you out here, is all right here in the Hackerspaces Initiative Wiki. I strongly recommend that if you're interested in hackerspaces, in the theory and developing things and questions, to go to the wiki, talk on the talk page, look at different things. If you've had an experience that fits in with the theory, write about it. Find the space that it works, share that with the rest of the community. If there's something that you disagree with, open it up on the talk page. You know, we're, we're not saying that we're experts on this. We're still learning. Decorating tips. HSI. <laughs> I mean, a HSI right now is very much in the research phase, and we need your help to perform that research. Um, and actually, while I have, uh, while I have this open, um, if you want to see what we're doing in our plans for um, Hacker Foundation's presence at the CCC camp, the other end of Hackers on a Plane, that's all here in the CCC events wiki. Uh, we strongly encourage you to look at that, and of course, the Hacker Foundation webpage, hackerfoundation.org. But getting back to the oh no, I'm in the wrong which is broken. It. It's broken. It's not broken. Okay. And, you know, sort of moving into more about U.S. hackerspaces. In looking at these things, we've identified five typical phases, like the life cycle for the average U.S. hackerspace. First phase, your first phase, birth. Typically, most hackerspaces in the United States, you start off with a strong leadership core. You start off with somebody that happens to have resources, that's the leader of a group that can aggregate resources, that says, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had our own hacker lab? They get together, they talk with their friends, and they say, yeah, you know, hacker lab, that, that, that'd be a really great idea. Sweet. So that one person, acting as an individual, goes, finds a space, signs a lease, and takes responsibility for it. Once the space is occupied, he and the group of friends that he had starting out with, you know, get in the space and they start doing stuff. They're like, oh, wow, you know, all these things that I was doing in my basement by myself, I can do with my five friends. I can leave my computers here. We can share all of our different equipment. It's great. Hackerspace, you know, maybe year, year one, year two in, more people in the community find out about it. Maybe they've thrown a couple of parties. Maybe all of those members that walked into it have invited all of their friends and saying, hey, you know, look at my cool space. And then in the community, that hackerspace achieves some kind of notoriety that maybe they've held a couple events. They say, hey, a lot of people know about it. A lot of people really like this space. Let's do more for that. And then it sort of reaches a critical mass at some point. Drama sets in. <laughs> you know about the drama. We all know about the drama. Right. The drama sets in. And because there was no formal organization 
going into it was just one person signing a lease to share a space with a group of friends. Taking all the risk. Taking all the risk. There, the phase starts with some sort of leadership crisis, that maybe that one person has a falling out or some kind of bad incident with another one of the members. And then that creates tension that draws everybody else who's in that space into it. And then Boing Boing and Wired get involved. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I'm <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, you get the electric bill. You know right. something, something happens that ignites a crisis that sort of shakes the leadership foundation, the stuff that made that space work. The leadership crisis, typically what happens, this has happened, it happened uh, in Boston. This I saw this happen in New Hack City when I was living in San Francisco. The person who had their name on the lease just doesn't renew it. And then he passes it off to somebody else. He says, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this. This used to be a lot of fun. It's not fun anymore. I'm out. Here are the keys. See ya. Someone else takes over. But somebody who didn't have that experience of going out, dealing with commercial landlords, paying the electric bill, all these different things, ends up learning the process. You know, when they, and they learn the process by collection notices. They learn the process by bad phone calls from the landlord. The man you know, comes for a visit. PG&E goes in. Some random telco guy comes in, sees that's obviously a hackerspace, and then concludes that that's the problems that he's having in that entire CLEC. This actually happened in San Francisco. <laughs> and, you know, it's a cry for help. The person's like, I, I can't believe that, you know, that they could actually make this work. This, this doesn't happen. And so that person gives up. Maybe one more person tries to take over for him, but eventually you get into the last phase, the hackerspace dies. Ooh. Everybody takes whatever's equipment is in there, they vacate the space, they give it back to the landlord, and they get to keep the security deposit. We want to change that pattern, obviously. <laughs> Um, we, when you're organizing and thinking about a hackerspace that you might want to build in your community, don't think of it as a clubhouse. Think of it as something that you're going to operate as a public trust. And when I say public trust, I mean don't think of your hackerspace as your personal lab to share with your five friends. Think of it as a space you know, where you and your friends, people that you haven't met yet, can come collaborate and contribute something can contribute something to the other hackers in your community, can contribute to hackers around the United States, can contribute to hackers around the world. You have to think of it. And if, you're, if you want to start a space through the Hackerspaces Initiative, you have to think about it as a public trust. Just like many of the other nonprofit spaces that you may have interacted with, you have to think of it like that, as something that you're operating for the public good. Like a library, that's, that's great. That's actually, get, think of your hackerspace as a library, a shared community resource that you're there and operating for the good of the community. But without dumb books in it. Right. And <laughs> I hate dumb books. Okay, stop, right? Why are you killing me? Yeah, I'm killing Okay. When, and when you go into it, be aware of why hackerspaces have died previously. Be aware of why we can't, in this country, seem to get a hackerspace that stays and is productive and good for five years. You have to think about, okay, I know I'm really great friends with all of my five people now, but what happens if you know, one of my buddies starts dating my girlfriend? You know, what, what happens when drama happens? You have, to, you have to set things up, and if you can make an arrangement of the people who are going to be the custodians of the space ahead of time so that you know what's supposed to happen if there's interpersonal conflict, you can avoid that interpersonal conflict from ruining the space. You have to have formal governance procedures. This is not a tremendously uncommon thing. People who do nonprofit work tend to experience a higher rate of interpersonal drama than people who are in a corporate environment. And you have to think about that, and you have to prepare for that, and you have to formalize. Um, one of the things that HSI is going to do, we, we don't want to run your space. We want to help you run your space. And we're going to be there for you if something happens in the future. HSI plans on offering mediation services. We plan on offering corporate governance services. We're, we're not going to leave you after you set up your space. And of course, HSI wants your space to share best practices and things that are, you know, if one hackerspace develops a really good way for accomplishing something, HSI wants to be able to share that with all of the other hackerspaces that are operating under HSI um, in the United States. And I think th these are, this is how we're going to avoid hackerspaces dying, and this is how we're going to make hackerspaces last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, just like they are in Europe. Okay, you might be asking, so how do I go about building my hackerspace? We've sort of broken down all of the long, long list of tasks that you need to accomplish to go out there, rent a commercial space, and operate as a public good. First phase, organizing. This is critical. 
Hackerspaces in the United States, when they walk into it, walk into it with a very base level of organization. The, the very minimal amount of stuff that they need to do to get the keys to a space. You can't do that. You have to organize. You have to figure out how the people that are going to operate this space are going to work together. Um, in the wiki right now, we're saying that people who are going to start a hackerspace should consider registering as a nonprofit organization in their state. Registering as a nonprofit in your state is not the hard part. The hard part is seeking 501c3 tax exempt status from the IRS. Well, guess what? Hacker Foundation already did that. If you organize as a nonprofit group in your space and have a stated mission that falls in with the IRS's definition for nonprofit, we can provide 501c3 tax exempt status so that you can go out there, collect donations, and get people to donate to your hackerspace and get a tax write off on their federal taxes for it. After you organize as a group and know how you're going to work, start planning. You have to do needs assessment, budgeting, figure out how you're going to raise money, and figure out how the space is going to do what it sets out to do. Third phase, after you've organized, after you've planned for what you want, you know what you're looking for. You can go out there into the commercial real estate market, know what kind of spaces would work well, what kind of spaces you might want to fall back on, and what kind of spaces you want to avoid. And that you know, going into it, as a legal nonprofit, you can sign as a legal nonprofit on that space. So that if everything just happens to fall apart. It goes you know, off a cockfa. Bad. It goes bad. It goes, if it goes bad, <laughs> that, that's not, what you know, means, people. Okay. If it goes bad, you don't have one person who's left out there holding the bag. Next phase, after you've signed a lease, after you have keys to a space, you have to take all of these plans that you made in step two and build it out. Figure out what you need to do, get there, figure out, you know, if you need electrical contractors, if there's something that you can do on your own, or some friend of a friend that happens to be associated with the group that can help and do that. That's what the build out phase is all about. And now that you've got the keys, now that you've got the hackerspace, now that everything's up and running, you have to figure out how you're going to keep it going for as long as you possibly can, hopefully indefinitely. And that's what the sustaining phase is about. And through all of this, you can help illustrate how your hackerspace is going to meet the mission of the Hacker Foundation. If we're going to be providing the 501c3 cover for your local outfit, you have to be able to demonstrate in the event that we get audited by one of our donors, in the event that we get audited by the IRS and they're looking through all these different things, you have to have on paper something to show the IRS saying that, yes, this is a tax-exempt project. First step, organizing. Like I said, we strongly recommend, if you want to, and granted there are advantages and disadvantages to this, to starting a nonprofit registered in the state that the hackerspace is going to be in. This process involves you know, filling out a form and paying a fee to the state, writing your bylaws, figuring out how things are going to work, and acting like a nonprofit organization, which has a board of directors and meets every so often. Maybe the board of directors are the five people in that space. And that you meet every so often, you have meeting minutes, you do things like this. A lot of this is not complicated. One of the reasons HSI is around is to help you do that as simply as possible. After you've started your local nonprofit organization, that's when you talk to us, you say, hey, okay, we've done this. Now, how do we formalize the relationship so that we can say to people, yeah, if you donate to our hackerspace, you get a tax write-off. Once that part is done, you can go out there and you can start fundraising. Money that the five core people who are in that hackerspace are putting into it should be able to be tax-deductible donations that the five people who are putting it in can write off on their taxes. If you end up shelling $3,000, of your own money into the hackerspace, you should be able to write that off on your taxes. And then another critical part of the organizing outfit is deciding who you want to serve specific roles. If there's somebody who's a strong leader in your group, they should be the president. If there's somebody who doesn't have really great leadership skills, but they have really great organizing skills, they should be the secretary, the vice president. If there's somebody who aced all of their accounting classes, you probably want them as your treasurer. And you have to really think about that when you're starting and organizing your spaces. Who's going to do what key critical things? Going into the second phase. Now that you've got your organization, you know who's involved, you know what they're going to be doing, you have to figure out, well, what do we want to do with our hackerspace? You know, who do we want to be? How do we want to present ourselves to the public? What are we going to be contributing to the public good? A one, one very critical thing about a hackerspace is who gets keys. It, you might not want to have everybody involved in your group to have keys to the space so that they can get to it 24-7. But you want to operate it as a public good. You have to work out, well, you know, are we going to be open 9 to 5 so that people can stop in and maybe get help with something or can look at our project? You have to figure out how you're going to work it. Um, 
If there's other groups that want to utilize your space, you have to figure out, well, how are we going to allow them access? Are one of the core organizers going to be there to open up the space for them? Are they going to you know, drive by, give them the keys, and then lock up the space and they're done? This is a very, very critical thing because if something goes wrong, if somebody's you know, switch or valuable piece of equipment gets stolen, you're going to want to figure out who had access to the space at any given time. And, of course, you have to figure out, in this needs assessment phase, how are the things that we want to do in planning serve you know, the exempt purposes that we set out to serve at the beginning? Also in the planning phase, and this is obviously very important, figuring out where your money is going to come from. If the space costs $1,000 to rent every month and you've got five people involved, is everybody in a position to donate $200 a month? And you have to work this out. Odds are that the people who you're going to start your hackerspace with have all varying different levels of income. And you have to figure out if there's somebody who's making a lot of money, are they willing to put in for the term of the lease, you know, maybe three times as much as everybody else? These are the sort of, you know, long drawn out things that lead to a death of a hackerspace that if you work out in advance, you can keep the hackerspace going. Another thing, maybe all five of you are totally flat broke, but you know how to raise money. You know how to get people involved. You know how to get people enthusiastic about your space. You know how to use the space as a public good and get resources from the community so that you don't have to pay the rent bill all by yourself. And of course, once you know where your money is going to be coming from, once you've worked that out, you can figure out what are all your expenses. It doesn't matter how effective your planning is, there's always going to be some expense that you haven't thought about. But the things that you know about in advance, rent, you got to pay the rent on the space, utilities. If you have a hacker space, you're going to have a big power bill. There's no way around it. It doesn't matter how many wind turbines or solar cells you use. Computers use a lot of juice. It's called the budget plan, kids. Right. Learn it, love it. And another thing, not every commercial space out there is wired for 220. Maybe you want to have 220 power going into that. It's off, you know, often, if you have access to commercial power rates, they tend to be cheaper. And if you can, take, you know, if you can think about that ahead of time and say, yeah, we want to get cheap, dirty industrial power instead of paying you know, residential clean power, you know, we want to do that. But you have to talk to the utility company before you can have that happen, and you have to budget for it. A lot of times, if you're going throughout a commercial venture, there's a lot of money that you're out there. And if you're a nonprofit, and if you have no credit history, they're going to want to deposit to make sure that they're not totally wasting money for doing all this stuff to get your hackerspace wired the way that you want it wired. Another critical thing is furniture. Where's it going to come from? Is everybody in your space going to take all of the stuff, all of the racks, all the chairs, all the tables out of your basements and just you know, donate it to the space and put it in the space? Fine. You don't have to worry about that. But maybe if you have more artists in your group, maybe if you have more creative types in people, you're saying, you know, I've seen a lot of these, you know, all the cool furniture and the setup and all this stuff that they have in Germany. I want to do that. You have to plan for that. That's a big expense. And then finally, when you occupy a space, when you get commercial space normally, it's just a blank box. You're going to have to do something other than furniture. You're going to have to figure out where you want to put your power, where you want to put your network, if you want the space to be reconfigurable, if you want the space to be one set thing, if you want to have a server room that nobody can get access to, you're going to have to build that and figure out what it costs to build that. And then after you've satisfied these things for the space, you have to figure out, well, what are the sorts of things that we want everybody to have access to? Do you want to have a budget to go out and buy tools? Do we always want to have a spool of Cat5 available? What are the sorts of, you know, in less set, less um, concrete things that we want to offer? This is when you go back, you look at your planning. Well, if we always want to have a spool of Cat5, we have to figure out how much Cat5 we're going to need. Are we going to have to have a constant supply of ends? Who's going to have access to that? These are the kind of costs that you have to think about before you can even go out and sign a lease on a space. But once you've got this sort of thing done, you can go into the fun part, going out there and looking at spaces. How commercial real estate works is very different depending on what market you're in. If you're on the East Coast, if you're in New York, Renting commercial real estate works a lot differently than it works in San Francisco, which works a lot differently than it works in Chicago, Atlanta, things like that. You have to know your commercial real estate market. <coughs> Oftentimes, it might be more helpful to try looking for spaces in areas that are undergoing gentrification, just old plants that are out there that are sitting empty that they just want to rent. They just want to have people in the space so that there's people in the neighborhood going to the coffee shops, and they'll give it to you for a dollar a square foot. Great. If you can find a space like that that's really cheap, that's really great, that fits your needs in your community, go out and get that. But maybe you're like, well, I don't want to be in a gentrified space where 
you know, there's a cool coffee shop now, but then Starbucks is going to move in. Well, maybe you want to be in the industrial urban core. Maybe you want to be where all of the professionals are. You know, New York, if you're looking at commercial space, the Empire State Building is actually a pretty good deal for where it is. Wouldn't it be cool to have your hackerspace if you live in New York in the Empire State Building? You can do that, and it's really not that expensive, but you have to look at it. And of course, again, when you're going out there, you have to look at your budget analysts for given space for the lease. Commercial leases are a pain, but then again, this is where HSI can help you. We have access to people with expertise who know how commercial real estate works, who can look at a lease that a landlord gives you, figure out if there's anything abusive, if there are any illegal lease clauses there, if there's you know, little ticking time bombs. Um, a lot of people are going to need it. A lot of commercial real, real estate people are going to want insurance. A lot of others just roll the cost of insurance into your overall rent payment. But if you have a lease agreement there and the commercial real estate who's dealt with, people who've always dealt with commercial real estate in that space, just automatically think that you're going to go out there and get insurance, you have to know that. You have to read the lease very, very carefully. If they require insurance, you have to go out and, you have to go out and get it. Because if your landlord comes back four or five months later and says, oh yeah, hey, you guys forgot to send us your certificate of insurance, and if it says in the lease, you need to have insurance or we can kick you out in 24 hours, the commercial landlord can go in there, move all of your stuff, kick it out on the street, and then you know, hope that the people who actually own it can come pick it up. That's why you have to be very, very careful. Commercial real estate is even worse than residential real estate. <clears throat> That's why you know, acquisition is its own rough <laughs> phase in and of itself. And of course, if you've got the five people, you're going to want to decide, okay, well, are we going to trust one person to go out there and lease the space? Or are we all going to split up, look at all the different neighborhoods, take one, and then pick one space in that particular neighborhood that we're going to audition for the rest of the group and decide? HSI will help you go through this phase to decide what you want in the market that you want it. And obviously, this phase ends when you have the lease, you've looked it over, you know exactly what you're signing, and you're signing it on behalf of your organization. Going into the build-out phase. Now that you've got your space, you know what you want to put in it, you have to build it. This phase is complicated because even though even the most careful planning, there's always going to be things that you didn't anticipate. Maybe all of those outlets that were in your space that made it look so great, well, maybe only half of them are actually wired for power. This has happened before. And you have to figure out, well, do we want to wire all of those different things or do we want to come up with a plan B? <coughs> in the build-out phase, once you've planned, and now once you know what space you have, you can take all those different things and lay out a floor plan. You can decide, okay, well, do each of us want a different space? Great. Where are we going to put it? How's it going to work? How's it going to work in relation to our server room? Are we going to want to have all of our computers and our lab be half of the space and then have the other half of the space be a public area where anybody can do whatever they want? This is very complicated, and it takes a lot of getting into to, to determine what your floor plan is going to be, what it's going to cost, and what the advantages and disadvantages is of various different ways of laying things out. Once you know what you want to build, you have to go out and generally, depending on your lease clause, obtain permission to do it. If you want to move walls, if you want to build walls, if you want to rewire outlets, depending on your lease, depending on your power company, depending on who your local telco is, you may have to get permits and permission to do this. And then once you have that, you got to go out and buy it, you got to go out and do it, you got to do the building. If you're rewiring electricity, you want to have a licensed electrician do it unless there's somebody who you know is either really good at wiring it or really doesn't mind being electrocuted. Jen, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> Jen wired her own Jen, and just, just so that you guys know, um, Jen Gergen, B9 Punk, who's down here, um, is you know, sort of the fairy godmother of the Triple H, the hackerspace that we mentioned in New York. And as we've been going through all these Godmother different like godfather. Okay, right. it's like that, like the Godfather. She's been, she's been down here laughing throughout my whole speech because all of the different scenarios that I've outlined, she's lived through about 80 to 90 percent of them. She's done them wrong. She's Actually, done them all. We just went through it, just went, oh, what'd they do wrong? Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. uh-huh, uh-huh. All right. Reversed amount. Really now that your hackerspace is all set up, everything's good, everything's the way you want it, you have to figure out how are we going to keep this thing that we invested so much time and energy in, how are we going to keep it going? Um, a couple of the things that we think hackerspaces should be doing, if you've got a group of five people, you should be meeting regularly. You should know who's staying involved, what their plans are for the near-term future, what their plans are for the long-term future, and you should sit down and resolve problems 
before these problems become miscommunications, which become misunderstandings, which lead to phase five and the death of your space. You have to ensure that what you guys are doing is equal. You have to figure out, are we all playing the roles that we set out to do when we started this thing? And, if, and you know, these are the things that you have to really think about to keep the hackerspace going. Once you have a hackerspace, maybe you want your local 2600 meeting to meet there so that you can show people what you have to offer, get more people involved, make it so that some random person who picks up a 2600 for the first time knows, oh wow, there's a hackerspace in my community, and can go there and can meet. Maybe you have a lock picking group that no doesn't have a space course. to meet, that doesn't really feel comfortable you know, with the 2600 people, but they would be really great contributors to your hackerspace. Maybe you want them to be able to meet there. Training sessions. If there are people out there that are really good at training, that are really good at open source advocacy, open up your hackerspace to teach people how to use open source software, teach them all of these great things that are out there, which they may not know about because they're not necessarily connected into what we're connected into. And of course, engage the public. Host public forums, host information sessions, figure out if there are other groups in the area that can use your space and work things out together. You know, there are many little groups out there that are willing to pay 20 bucks a month in rent to have a monthly meeting space. That's a possible source of income that you can get your space paid for with. Figure out, you know, do we want to throw concerts here? Do we want to have little area shows? Is our hackerspace in a neighborhood that doesn't have a good venue for people who are under 21? Host workshops. And definitely, once you, absolutely, the day that your hackerspace is all done and built, have a public open house. Meet the people in your neighborhood. If you're in a, you know, if you're in the Empire State Building, hold an open house so that you can introduce yourselves to everybody else that's on your floor. This is a critical thing because if you're in a warehouse or a shared space or in a neighborhood and you get to know your neighbors, your neighbors will be watching out for you. But you have to invite them in. If you just go to your space and you don't interact with anybody else who's there, you know, you lose the benefit of being a good neighbor and having your neighbors be good to you. Jesse, you had something? No, no. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. If you were like, but, but, I'm so ready. I'm so ready. <coughs> okay. Sorry. Excuse we had me. Any questions. Okay. No, we will. What? How much time do we have left? None. What? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. Um, then I'm just going to cruise through the rest of these. Um, HSI is going to build hackerspaces in areas that we think are sustainable. Even if you live in a small town, if you have a really large, well-connected hacker community, maybe you can make a hackerspace work there. And I want to move there. Right, but normally in just doing the research that we've um, been doing over the past couple of years, we've identified the areas that are highlighted on this map as areas that we think would be really good and can benefit from a hackerspace and have people in them who can support and continue with the hackerspace. If this was a bar, this is where we're feeling lucky. <laughs> All right, sorry. Oh, wait, what? Go back to the map. Okay, what? Somebody have questions about the map? Yes. Yes, okay. you. See, Go to the wiki. That's why we that didn't talk there, about it. And we'll revise the map. Or just, you know, the map why is didn't you on tell the wiki me last too. night. Download it, highlight it, and upload it back yourself. <laughs> and we have to stop that. We have to be sharing this. And now, I'm sorry I, I overspoke. And if you have any other questions that we can't get to here, come visit us. This could be yours. Up in the, yeah. <laughs> up in the con suite. But are there any questions out there that, yes, Seth? Yes, Seth Hardy. There's five stages of growth and decline. Yes. Which stage do you believe Triple H is in? No comment at this time. Next Thank question. you very much. <laughs> yes. Do you have tips for, so when you go to an insurance company and you say, hi, I'd like a, a liability policy for this space where random things will happen. People will have all kinds of their own possessions in it. And there'll be concerts and parties and drugs and underage children. Oh, my. And the insurance guy looks at you and says, no problem. We have a policy for you. <laughs> Five billion dollars a month. Do you have any tips for mitigating the huge... Yeah. I, I hate to say this, but um, just to repeat your question, he's wondering, uh, do you have any tips for going out there and seeking insurance when you're running a hacker space where a lot of different things could go on? What about your community technical lab? Yeah, the, well, the, well the, and this is what I'm talking about. If you've done all of your due diligence in the first two phases and you have all of these different scenarios and contingencies out in a 20-page document that you hand the insurance agent, that they've and if you if you give an insurance agent a 20 page document of all the possible contingencies and everything else that could go wrong they're not going to read it they're <laughs> going to say oh you've done your homework you're a professional you know what they're doing 
and they're going to write you a policy that will prob they will probably live to regret. <laughs> but not for five million dollars. Yeah, that, the, the key tip for that is to do your homework. Um, any other, do we have any other questions? Questions? Yeah, Jesse, down in front, behind you, there. Um, maybe this is a real broad question. Um, I may have missed the first five seconds of the um, presentation where I missed this, but is a hackerspace more for um, a group of people that know each other that grow slowly or something that would be a known staple in the community where someone would say, I've got this thing to do, I want to go to the hacker space. I if it's a more of a staple as opposed to a graduated clubhouse, like you said, it's not supposed to be, um, are there facilities or methodologies for maybe maintaining that without making it into a business? Uh, for example, the library, um, late fees. Um, there's other, I don't know how a library sustains itself, to be honest. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is something that you have to decide as a local group. You know, we, we don't, we, we, there's no way for us as HSI to be able to determine how you guys work together and what you want to do, how you're going to do it. This is why the first two phases are critical. What, are, what is your group tooled up and set out to do? How do you want to operate it? There are many, many different ways to operate a public good. The Red Cross works differently than the library, which works differently from the ACLU. Every group has their own best way of working things out among themselves and serving the public. And this is what HSI is doing. It's helping local groups go out there, get organized, and start a space. And so that, that question really entirely depends on what you want to do and what the questions that you're hopefully going to be answering in the first two phases. D does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Angus. <laughs> Use the mic. Put your hand up. Oh, man, you do, you, do you have some sample uh, mission statements on the site? Uh, or suggestions where you could say this is what we want to en envision and maybe this is what a mission statement might look like? We don't and that's that's something that we should work on in the wiki and I, I strongly encourage you to either email us or just go out there maybe start a section on the wiki saying local mission statements but about mission statements in our experience you know in the research that we've been doing we've noticed that every different region or every different subset of you know of industry has their own way of formatting mission statements Perhaps there's a standard mission statement, uh, you know, a default thing that's required by the regulations in your particular state, that your mission statement has to look like this. So really, that mission statement question, I'm really, really reluctant to say that you know, a mission statement that works in New York is going to work in San Francisco or LA or Atlanta or Chicago. What I strongly encourage you to do in those first two phases is figure out how local nonprofits are phrasing their mission statements. And, you, and not, honestly, when you're thinking about a hackerspace in your community, Look at other nonprofits that have space there. Maybe there's, you know, I know in Michigan we have something called the Cool Cities Initiative that offers grants so that local artist collectives, local things that contribute to the quality of life and encourage young professionals to move to that particular state or area um, want to see. And they give money so that that happens in their community. You really want to look at how those other nonprofits in your, local, your, your area are doing that in, in those first two phases. So, and I, I don't, and that's the critical thing. I don't want to, you know, these, this is just something, the things that I'm presenting here are stuff that everybody has to deal with. There are many, many other things that are specific to your community that you're going to have to deal with, which is I strongly encourage, you know, in that first phase to look and see how other nonprofits are doing things. Uh, any other, other question? Uh, Not actually, Seth. we're, we're yes. out of time. We're no, out no, of no, time. I, Let's take it to the con suite. What? Oh, we're out of time. Okay, we're out of time. We're going to be in the con suite. Please come visit us there. I actually have, am giving a talk on uh, hacking your finances at 8 o'clock, so Jesse will be available to do that. I'm going to go work on my speech. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Yeah, can, Jesse, can uh, Jen say something?